You probably already know what memory is. I have no memory in this place. In a computer, you can find many types of memory. Hard drives, SSDs, RAM, cache, CPU registers. And if you closely examine each hardware component, you will find that they most likely have their own memory, ROM chips, flash memory to store firmware, small amounts of RAM, caches and internal registers. Why are there so many types? The answer is pretty simple. Speed and cost. CPU registers are the fastest type of memory, as they can be accessed almost instantly. However, adding more registers will significantly increase the complexity of the CPU and it may even hamper its performance. RAM is a trade-off. It's significantly faster than hard drives or SSDs, but their cost is significantly higher. A 32GB kit of DDR4 memory costs around $100. For the same price, you could get a 1TB SSD or a 6TB hard drive. If we arrange all of these memory types based on speed and cost, we will end up with this hierarchy, a pyramid scheme. At the top we have the CPU registers, which are very fast but extremely costly. Below that we have all the CPU cache layers, then the RAM, the SSD and finally the hard drives. And of course, let's not forget about the portable media, optical disks, SD cards, USB flash drives, network storage, etc. Looking at this pyramid, we can also notice a pattern. All the memory types above this line are volatile, which means that they require active power to maintain them. In other words, volatile memory is ephem ephemeral. Ephemeral. Okay. Ephemeral. In other words, volatile memory is ephemeral. When the computer is powered down, its contents are lost. SSDs and hard drives are non-volatile, which means that they will continue to hold the data even when the system is powered down. One of the most important roles of an operating system is to manage all of these resources. But first, let's see who is responsible for managing each type of memory. Starting from the top, we have the CPU registers, which are typically managed by the compiler or manually by the software developer if he writes in assembly. Of course, there are registers which have special meanings. We are talking about the general purpose registers here. On the next level, we have the cache, which is managed automatically by the CPU. Yes, there are many strategies in which we can help the CPU manage the cache, like accessing memory in a cache friendly manner. But in any case, this is the responsibility of the CPU. For the next types of memory, there are two major components of an operating system responsible for managing them. The memory manager and the virtual file system. The memory manager is responsible for managing RAM, but it might also use parts of the hard drive in case the RAM fills up, which is called swapping or paging. The virtual file system, on the other hand, is responsible for managing all the non-volatile storage, hard drives, SSDs, USB drives, optical disks, and so on. Today our focus will be on the first of these components, the memory manager. But before we can talk about memory management, we have to address memory address space. This is a very important concept, which is at the core of memory management. As you probably already know, the smallest memory unit that you can access on an x86 machine is one byte, and you can access any byte of memory by specifying its address. A memory address space is essentially the set of all the possible memory addresses on a particular system. There are two types of memory address spaces, depending on our, you know, on which perspective we are talking about, depending on the perspective. Uh, there are two types of memory address spaces, the physical memory address space and the virtual memory address space. Let's start by talking about the physical address space. This is the memory address space which the CPU exposes to the hardware. The easiest way to determine the physical address space of a CPU is to look at how many address pins it actually has. 
a modern 64-bit Intel processor has 48 address pins, meaning that their address space is 2 to the power of 48 possible addresses. This means that they can theoretically access roughly 200 terabytes of memory. Hey, it's me from the editing bay and it looks like I was slightly wrong. 48 is not the actual number of physical address lines used on CPUs, but it is the theoretical maximum of the x86 architecture. I'm currently looking at the datasheet for the 12th generation Intel Core processors, where I found this section which mentions that the processor supports 512GB or 39 bits of addressable memory space. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find these datasheets for Xeon and AMD processors, but if you are using Linux, there is a way to find out how many lines your processor has by printing the PROC CPU info file and then looking for the address sizes section. As you can see, my 8th gen i7 also has 39 physical address lines. Server CPUs like Intel Xeon or AMD Epic likely have a slightly higher number of lines, since servers with terabytes of RAM aren't unheard of. Note that this number is not related to the maximum amount of RAM a system can have. The amount of RAM is limited by the memory controller and is usually smaller than this address size. The upper memory regions can still be mapped to hardware. Older 32-bit processors had a limit of 2 to the power of 32 possible addresses, meaning that they could only access up to 4 GB of physical memory. The original 8086 only had 20 address lines, meaning that it could only access a theoretical maximum of 2 to the power of 22 addresses, which is roughly 1 MB. Something you might find interesting is that back in the old days, there were computers where the minimum addressable unit wasn't one byte like it is today. You will find this in many mainframes from the 50s and 60s. For example, the PDP-15 had an 18-bit word length. What this means is that you could only access memory in blocks of 18 bits. The machine had a maximum addressable space of 128 kilowords meaning 128,000 multiplied by 18 bits per word, giving us 2.3 million bits, or if we divide that by 8, that would be equivalent to 288 kilobytes as we know them today. Note that the physical address space of a CPU is not the same thing as the maximum amount of RAM that can be installed on that system. While most of this address space is usually allocated to RAM, some of it is mapped to hardware, and we've already interacted with one of these hardware mapped memory regions. When we write text to the address B8000, we don't actually write them to memory, we write them directly to the video card. Also, there are some ways in which the CPU can access more RAM. For example, by banking. This was used in older systems. So, the physical address space is the memory space which is exposed to the hardware. From the software point of view, we have the virtual address space. When a program wants to access some memory, it will pass a virtual address to the CPU and the memory management unit, which is a component of the CPU, will translate that into a physical address that it can use to interact with hardware. In 16-bit real mode, the virtual address space is that segment and offset addressing scheme that we have used before. The memory management unit will take this pair of 16-bit numbers, the segment and the offset, and then convert that to a 20-bit address, and we already know how it does that. In 32-bit protected mode, there are two mechanisms used by the CPU to map a virtual address to a physical address. First we have segmentation, which is configured through the global descriptor table, and we've already talked about that in a previous video. Segmentation is an old and deprecated feature, so most operating systems will just configure the global descriptor table to directly map virtual addresses to physical addresses without doing any kind of transformation, and we call this linear memory addressing. The second mechanism is paging. The CPU can be configured through a page table to map any virtual address to any physical address that we want. While this feature is optional in 32-bit protected mode, uh, it is a very important mechanism because it allows us to achieve process isolation, 
swapping, memory mapped files and many other features which you will see in any modern operating system. In 64-bit protected mode or long mode, segmentation is no longer used at all and paging is now mandatory. Now that we have an idea about how memory works on an x86 system, let's break down this memory management subject into a couple of subtopics. And we will start with physical memory, more exactly on how to detect physical memory. Before we can actually manage that physical memory, we need to know how to detect it. We want to know which memory regions are safe to use, we want to know which regions are mapped to hardware and which regions hold important data that we must not overwrite. In the next video we will talk about managing physical memory and we will look at several algorithms and strategies and pick one for our operating system. After that we will talk about managing virtual memory and that will also be a big topic and we will have a dedicated video about that. Once we go through all of these we can finally manage the heap and this is where we finally get to implement malloc and free. Finally, we will have a video about the physical address extension mechanism. It is mandatory for 64-bit and I think it deserves its own video. So, finally we get to almost code. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about detecting physical memory. The goal of this process is to build a map so that we can know which memory regions exist and what we can safely use. If you are using Linux, you can actually see the memory map it has built by looking at the proc iomem file. Of course, our map will not be as detailed as Linux because to figure out which device uses which region of memory, we also need to go into hardware detection, which is a whole different topic that we will go to in future videos. By taking all the entries which say system RAM and adding them up, we can calculate precisely how many bytes of RAM we have installed. In most circumstances on the x86 platform, memory detection is done by talking to the firmware. This is different than on the ARM platform, where most devices don't really have any detection mechanisms. Yes, there are some devices which support UEFI, which have UEFI firmwares, and they do allow memory and hardware detection, but unfortunately UEFI is not widely adopted on ARM. Not even the Raspberry Pi has UEFI. The way Linux solves this problem is through device trees. A device tree is essentially a file containing information about the memory layout and all the present hardware on a specific device. This is why in the ARM world operating systems are built specifically for the devices they support. And there isn't a general purpose installer that can work with any device like you have on PC in legacy or BIOS booting mode, which is the one we are using for our own operating system for the moment, this means calling BIOS interrupts. Unfortunately, it took a few tries until things became standardized, so there are multiple ways in which we can obtain this information. If you are using a relatively modern computer, which was made within the last 20 years or so, then it should support the E820 function, more exactly the interrupt 15 EAX E820. This is the only function which works with more than 4 GB of memory. In other words, this is the only function that matters. If you want, you could implement some of the other functions, but unless you really want to support very very old hardware, you shouldn't bother. These ancient computers are more trouble than they're worth, but if you still want to check it out, you can find a link in the description to the Detecting Memory article on the OS Dev Wiki, which goes into detail into all the ways you can detect memory. Because this procedure involves calling BIOS interrupts, it has to be done during the boot process, or exactly in the second stage of the bootloader, where we have some infrastructure in place for calling BIOS interrupts. Let's start by creating a function that wraps the E820 BIOS call that we can use from C. A small improvement that can make code more readable is to put the attribute cdecl in a macro called asm call. This way the intention is clearer. We want this function to be either implemented or called from assembly. 
the function will take two parameters. The first would be a pointer to the A820 memory block, which is a structure that the BIOS will fill for us. The second is a pointer to the continuation ID. This is a number that the BIOS gives us that we need to pass to the next call of the function. The initial value has to be set to zero, and when we reach the last entry in the list, the BIOS will also reset it to zero. You can think of it like an iterator in C++. The function will return an integer, which is the size of the structure filled by the BIOS. When we will reach the end of the list, this will also be zero. A memory block can have, depending on the BIOS implementation, either three or four fields. The base, which is the memory address where the memory block begins, the length, the type, which tells us what kind of memory block this is, the ACPI field is optional and it gives us some additional information on blocks related to ACPI. We can safely ignore it for the moment. Let's also create an enumeration for the types. One means that we can freely use this memory region, 2 is reserved, 3 and 4 are related to ACPI, and 5 means bad memory. Any other type not in this list should be considered reserved. Next, we will implement this function in assembly. Just like we did in previous videos where we had to deal with BIOS calls, we start by setting up the call frame and then going into 16-bit real mode. After doing whatever we need to do here, we will restore the registers that we modify and then go back into 32-bit protected mode restore the previous call frame and then return. EAX is modified while entering protected mode, which is why I save it to the stack. Let's check the documentation for the E820 function. As you can see, in addition to the function number E820, we also need to put this signature in EDX, for which we will define a constant. EBX will contain the continuation value, ECX the size and ESDI a pointer to the structure. I'm starting with the function arguments, and the first one is the pointer to the structure we want to fill. The function we are writing will be called from 32-bit protected mode, which means that in addition to the actual arguments, we will have a 32-bit or 4-byte return address, and then the 32-bit stack frame we pushed earlier. This means that the first argument will be located at BP plus 8. The linear to segment offset macro that we wrote a couple of videos ago will convert a 32-bit linear address into a 16-bit segment and offset address. The first argument is the address that we want to convert, then the register where we want to store the segment, in our case ES, then the 32-bit version of the register where we want to store the offset, EDI, and finally the register where we want to store the offset, DI. The second argument to the function is the continuation ID, which needs to be placed in EBX. Since we are passing a pointer to this continuation ID, the first step would be to dereference that pointer. Using the linear to segment offset macro, I convert the pointer to a segment and offset pointer that the processor understands in 16-bit real mode, and then I copy the data to EBX. Moving on, there are three more arguments we need to set for the BIOS call. The function number in EAX, which is E820, the signature in EDX, and the size of the structure in ECX, which is 24 bytes. Finally, we can call interrupt 15 hexadecimal. After returning, we need to validate the results by checking if the BIOS has put the signature in EAX. This way, we can tell if the BIOS actually supports this function or not, 
on success, we will return the size, which is returned by the BIOS through the ECX register, and also the continuation ID through the pointer. On failure, we just return minus 1. There's one more step before completing the implementation, which is to save and restore the modified registers. According to the CDECL calling convention, the one we are using, it is our responsibility to save all the registers except for EAX, ECX and EDX. Let's take a step back and think about what we want to achieve. Our goal is to create a map of the available memory regions and then use that information to set up our memory manager. The code we just implemented is located in the stage 2 of the bootloader because we needed to call the BIOS. However, the memory manager will be in the kernel, so we need to find a way to pass this information from the bootloader to the kernel. The best way to achieve that would be to create a structure that both stage 2 and the kernel know about and have stage 2 pass that structure when it passes control to the kernel. We want to avoid duplicating code, so let's create a boot library. This will be a header-only library, so the only change we need to make to the build process is to add the libs folder to the include path. We will take care of that in just a moment, let's start by creating the boot params header that will contain the boot params structure. We will store the memory map in a memory info structure which will contain two fields, the number of memory regions in the map and the pointer to an array of memory regions. The memory region structure simply mirrors that one of the E820, but by defining a new structure independent from the E820 memory block, it will be much easier to adapt this code so it works with other memory detection methods. Back to the boot param structure, let's add the memory info and also the boot device. Now let's get back to stage 2 and implement our main memory detection function, memory detect. We only have one argument, a pointer to a memory info structure that we will have to fill. I'm using a global variable to store the array of memory regions. As long as the kernel doesn't overwrite the memory space where stage 2 is, this array should remain accessible. To detect memory, we begin by setting up the call to the E820 function. We will need an E820 memory block structure and a continuation ID which is initialized to 0. RET will store the value returned by the BIOS interrupt. Then, in a do-while loop, we keep reading the next block as long as the return value is greater than 0, and also the continuation ID is greater than 0. For each memory block, we will store all the information in the memregions array, after which we increment the memregion count. <laughs> 
There's something I did incorrectly here when I recorded this video. I didn't check the return value before storing in the memory regions array, which might result in an extra memory region being added to the array. One way to fix the issue would be to replace the do while loop with a simple while and doing the red equals eh20 get next block in the while condition. Printing the memory regions at this point isn't a bad idea, so we can check if we are getting correct information. Finally, we need to fill the memory infrastructure passed as a parameter. All we need to do here is set the pointer to the memory regions array and the region count. Now that our memory detection is done, let's go to the stage 2 main.c and prepare this boot infrastructure so that we can pass it to the kernel. Before we can test, we need to take care of the build process. For this project, I am using the SCONS build system. You can find a link in the description to the live stream in which I made the switch and converted the whole project. This build system is based on Python and one of the core ideas is that of environments. An environment is an object that holds the configuration for the build. The cool part is that these environments can easily be cloned so you can have multiple variations of your build configuration in the same project. For my operating system, I have the host environment, which is the environment used for building stuff targeting the host system, such as utilities, tests, and then I have the target environment, which is used for building the components of the operating system using the cross-compiler toolchain. The top-level build configuration is stored in the S construct and sub-modules are called scan scripts. This is the stage 2 scan script where I start by importing the target environment I exported in the top-level construct and then I clone it and customize it. The cpp path variable contains the include path. This is where we need to add the libs directory. You can ignore the C path, I didn't know this at the time when I recorded this, but Scones uses CPP path for both C and C++. It took me a while to figure how to properly add the include path because Scones will not allow us to access stuff outside the directory where the scon script is. The way I solved this issue was in the top level construct by creating an additional variable in the host environment called project dir that refers to the root directory of the project. The host environment gets cloned to create the target environment and then the target environment is cloned in the stage 2 scan script which allows us to access the variable. And finally, time to test. 
and here we go, the memory map from Camo. Of course, on real hardware it will look a bit more ugly, for example, memory regions may not be ordered properly or they may overlap, which means that we will need to handle all of these cases in our memory manager. Let's do one more test in which we pass the boot infrastructure to the kernel to see that it works as we expect. We will start by modifying the kernel start function signature so that it has a pointer to the boot params structure. Even though the kernel will never return, I didn't want to pass pointers to things on the stack to the kernel, so I moved the boot params structure to a global variable. Next, we need to modify the kernel. Same as with stage 2, we need to add the source libs directory to the include path, and then we will add the boot params structure to the entry function. For the test, let's simply print all the memory information we receive from the bootloader. And this seems to work flawlessly. Great! So we successfully got the memory mapped and passed this information to the kernel. Next time we will learn about managing all this physical memory. Until then, thank you very much for your attention and if you have any questions feel free to join our Discord channel, the link is in the description below. Also I put links to all the relevant information as well as the source code in the description, so check that out. Until I see you next time, have fun and happy coding! Bye bye!